And the reality of the situation is this is just a hyper bubble. But there are some obviously good companies still left. You're paying an awful lot for them. Um, and the reality of the situation is, is when I look at the US equity market, I think this is a massively, massively, massively overvalued market versus the rest of the world, right? Like four standard deviations mm -hmm. overvalued versus the rest of the world. But those dynamics are unlikely to change until either the dollar declines and that hurts foreign investors who've got their money in the US and or the bubble bursts because it just runs out of puff, let's say, it doesn't look like that's the case. Or we go into recession and that doesn't look like the case either. And so for me, you've got this sort of ongoing, self-reinforcing, truly reflexive type cycle going on in the US equity market where the purchase of the asset, in this case, stocks, underpins, wealth underpins, employment underpins, Fed rate hike underpins, the dollar underpins the valuation of US stocks for foreigners. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very self-reinforcing, literally reflexive in the true Soros-esque sense of the world. Julian Brigden, welcome to Resolve Rips. How are you doing today, man? Doing well, doing well. I'm in, uh, I'm in Colorado again, so uh, we actually had some snow, so I'm, you know, happy camper. Excellent. It's just you and me today with the, the other uh, DGENs who, who sometimes join us or off in various productive activities, so um, we get to have all the fun. Um, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. So what... Um, what has been on your mind? What are you focused on at the moment? So, you know, the thing that's really been occupying our thoughts is this sort of dominant, let's put it like that, narrative of this Goldilocks soft landing. And I think the thing that I struggle with is that, first off, statistically, that's a very odd, unusual event. It's not the, the norm. Um, you know, the norm is we've had 12 tightening cycles since the 60s. We've had eight recessions. We've had four arguable soft landings. The problem that I have, and obviously the one that everyone quotes is this 95 sort of one onwards. Now, it's fair, I think, to assume that the Fed is pursuing the same sort of policy framework that he did in the late 1990s. But, uh, and we refer to it, this is opportunistic disinflationary policy framework. And I think, you know, this is one of the ones that we discussed with you guys when we were last on the show. And this idea of you, that when you have inflation of this sort of magnitude, there are truly two approaches you can take. The first one is you do what Volcker did and you, you create deliberate disinflation. So you kind of kill the economy. And the second one is you choke the economy, but not to the point of death. Um, just enough that over time you can grind inflation lower. Now, the issue with that is it, w it did work in 1995. That's true. Um, and that's certainly what they are trying to pursue. But there's a couple of problems with what's priced into markets based upon that. And the first one is, is if you never killed the economy, if you didn't strangle it, if you didn't deliberately annihilate it, um, and, Vo and Waller actually referred to this in his recent speech. If you don't break anything, there's no need for you to, to immediately start to create, right? Which is what we're pricing in markets, right? Yep. You can fine tune them so that real rates don't get too constrictive, but you don't need to slash them. And that's why, interestingly, the set forecasts, so the, so the Fed's central forecasts, um, are pricing in 75 basis points of cuts. And that's exactly what Greenspan did uh, between the beginning of 1995 and the end of, uh, and the beginning of 1996. And these were kind of then fine tuning. And then what's remarkable is then he left rates unchanged for the best part of 30 months. I mean, really 30 months, nowhere. Now he also got extraordinarily lucky and I'm not saying this couldn't happen. And he got the, 
building productivity that we saw as we ran up uh, into the dot-com uh, revolution. And maybe over time, we can get that from AI. But the question is, is, is it this year, right? Is it next year or is it the year after? Because if it isn't this coming year, then this idea that the Fed is going to be able to, you know, slash rates aggressively because inflation is falling and give you kind of the Goldilocks and the Goldilocks is accelerative or high, let's say, high levels of real growth, lower inflation and high levels of employment. And the other problem that we have is that in every other one of those quote unquote soft landing, or at least they think three of those quote unquote four soft landings, right, out of the 12 tightening cycles, every single one started with higher unemployment. And this is the problem that we see. If you try and accelerate growth from here, right, if you go from, you know, earnings growth being down 3% to up, 11 or 12 next year, which has to be driven by higher real growth in the economy. Okay. The problem is, is where you're going to find the bloody workers to do that with 3.7% unemployment, unless you're willing to take the risk of higher wage growth, which typically feeds straight into core service inflation. Now, there is one exception, one of those four soft landings, which I think is where we're running and looks most likely. And it looked like a soft landing. I don't classify it as a soft landing. It looked like a soft landing because for at least nine months, things went according to plan. And that was the only other time in history where we tried to accelerate growth or in post-war history, where we tried to accelerate growth from this level of unemployment. And that was the late 1960s. And what happened is inflation came down. The Fed had a little, they'd been tightening quite aggressively in 66 because inflation had broken out of a well-established range. They then had a little mini credit crisis, which was somewhat idiosyncratic in nature re related to Reg Q, but it caused a big slowdown in housing. And then they prematurely eased and they eased into ongoing fiscal spending. And unemployment never rose. It kind of flatlined for like, nine months and then it started to go back down again as growth picked up and what you ran into straight away was average early earnings took off core inflation went and the bond market went again and when i look at the world that i think is is the real danger i think the growth is just too robust um and i look at where rates are and they don't appear to be sufficiently tight to restrain GDP growth and to bring about that broad slowdown that the Fed is talking about. Because while the market is just singularly focused on headline inflation or core inflation or inflation in general, the Fed keeps talking about wanting to see growth slow down, wanting to see the labor market slow down, right? And these are much broader issues. So even, even if you get Goldilocks, the question is, is Goldilocks in what, right? Do you just get Goldilocks in inflation for nine months and then it reaccelerates as real growth accepts, right? It picks up. Or do you need to see slower growth? Because as I look at things, and I know that we've been, more and more people are jumping on this bandwagon, but we were pushing it at the end of last year. Looks to us that cyclical growth is actually reaccelerating. Yeah. And I, I sit here and I go, I'm struggling with the justification for the Fed to do 75, right? Let alone the double lap that the market's got priced in. So I think that's what's really sort of grabbing my attention and how does that pan out in markets? Yeah, I mean, so really the, the templates are the McChesney Martin 1966 pivot into the 1970s stagflation. Um, Correct. The Greenspan pivot in uh, in ninety five. Remind me, I remember, like so, so the nine the eighty nine to ninety four scenario was major um, run up and over leveraging of the commercial real estate market. Um, they set up a bad bank. They put yep. hundreds of the banks SNL. in receivership. Yep. Right. Walk, yep. walk me through what what happened there from sort of eighty nine to 94 and let's see if we can tease out 
the dimensions of that that are similar today and, and what might be different. Like, I remember there was a Bond massacre in 94, right? Correct. Correct. And that was, you know, that was another classic example where the bond market got kind of ahead of itself and on these assumptions and then got proved utterly wrong by a Fed that flipped on them. And, you know, this is, this is the sort of risk I think that we, we run because we'd had a, we'd had a big slowdown in 1990, right? We had a recession in 1990 and growth kind of picked up. And then CPI had been reasonably well behaved um, and was actually, but was still by Fed standards a little high. And this is, this is the point, right? I mean, they were dealing with inflation that was stuck, basically. It had come off the highs of around 6%, but it kind of got stuck in 94 into 95 um, at around this sort of 3%. And so Greenspan came along and he sort of decided that what he was going to try and do was kind of grind this out. And he did have the foresight to, to believe that productivity could allow this to happen. And, you know, productivity is the get out of jail free card, mm -hmm. right? And so productivity starts to pick up very rapidly as we're moving into the dot-com period. And what that enables you to do is kind of get the best of, of, of all worlds. You get... Falling inflation, right? And inflation falls, you know, from those three levels that, down to below two in 99 and um, straight for the bond market. It also enables you to have uh, great nominal GDP growth, kind of around the levels that we are now, around six, which is fantastic for corporate earnings because that's what they do. And unemployment as well also uh, continued to fall. Um, because we come from this, you know, relatively high level um, in the early 90s when we were, you know, we got 7.6%, right? So that was the big, and unemployment starting when he moved into this opportunistic disinflation, he started at sort of five and three quarters, and you got all the way down to the current level, 3.7. So that's, you were coming out of this recessionary kind of backdrop, and inflation just proved a little too stubborn. And so the Fed kind of sat there and allowed them, you know, played this game where they ground the thing out. And I said, the big difference is uh, in three of those four soft landings that you look at since the 1960s is that we always started with higher unemployment. Well, was there a material fiscal impulse then coming out of the, so they absorbed all these banks, they went into receivership. Like what, what caused that impulse coming out of the, the, the 1990 recession, this sort of real estate-based recession that drove hey, inflation higher. Was there anything structural about it? No, it was, it was sticky. I mean, inflation wasn't, wasn't significantly higher. I mean, if you look at where, you know, CPI, CPI did come down. I'm just looking at it now and so get the right numbers right. So if you look, you know, inflation had hit in 1990, 6.2%, 6 just over six. And then why, and then did, it the, why to, did Greenspan yeah. insist on raising rates in like big surprise it was proving, raise in 94? I mean, in, in a way it was proving sticky, right? Because it was stuck between 92 and 90, end of 96 at kind of 3%. And so he came up with this idea that what you need to do is you just nudge rates up a little bit to just kind of grind it out. And that's what they did, effectively. They cut them in, in, as we move into recession in the early 90s, they cut rates from eight and a quarter, basically down to three. Yeah, so and then in late 94, when the inflation proves resilient, or sorry, in, early, in early, uh, late 93 and into early 94, they then raise them back up again. Right. <clears throat> to, you know, basically six. So they double them. Right. And, what, and well, it's just to kind of grind it out. Right. Okay. So, so the economy was humming at that point. Um, it was back on its own two feet because they, they've yep. absorbed all those bad debts, have written it down. Yep. Um, yep. So the government was- Cleaned the balance sheet up, essentially allowed everything to sort of function properly again. I got gotcha. you. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think you, could, you, know, you can see it. I found it quite intriguing this morning to see the story that we got on Bloomberg about, I don't know if you saw it, about the banks starting to um, 
duke it out with um, private credit to fund all this leveraged buyout debt that's coming due. Right, so the banks had all going, been sort of squeezed out of this space last year and the year before, and private equity basically funded all these these deals. Right, and now the banks are trying to get back into that space now that you know rates are lower and so on and so forth. And to me, you know, this is indicative of this easing of financial conditions that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Right, the question is, is you know, is that justified? And I question that. You know, I. Unless I, you know, I'm very much of the opinion that the labor market in broad aggregate terms, so how much people earn, how many people are working, that sort of thing in, you know, in totality, if you look at the labor market, basically dictates, dictates nominal GDP because it's, you know, consumption 60% of GDP. And if you look at it, it suggests nominal GDP of still around six. And so. You know, this is where I, I have this problem of, you know, how do we sustain 6% nominal GDP with 3.7% unemployment? And the risks are, as I think, see things at the moment, you know, if you go back to that Goldilocks analogy, the porridge is too hot still. It isn't just right. And the risk is, for whatever reason, the Fed seems to be happy with that which I think is a long-term threat to the long end of the bond market. But let's, the same, let's assume that they get it wrong, that the, the data that they think is softening, which they do, doesn't soften, as my model suggests is not going to be the case. And then they turn around to us in March and they go, no rate cut. And then they turn around to us in June and go, no rate cut. And they turn around to us in September and go, no rate cut. Yeah. Then, then the risk is then that at some point, by holding rates here, you'll actually will do more damage because as the refis come up and we know the commercial real estate problems, et cetera, et cetera. And then the risk is that you'll actually tip over the employment market and the thing will become too cold. But, you know, because it, the, the bottom line, I think, I mean, I, my, well, my bottom line I've been pushing to my clients is, look, Goldilocks is not the base case. Statistically, it best one in three. And given that, Three of those four occasions when we did end up with it mm -hmm. started with much higher unemployment. Yep. And the one where the unemployment started at the current levels and it wasn't really a sustainable Goldilocks scenario. As I said, it lasted for like nine months and then went horribly wrong again as inflation soared. Yep. I think the, I think the true odds of Goldilocks are far lower than one in three. Yeah, Julian, I mean, what's not really talked about so much is the fact that we've got unemployment that's so low, we've got inflation that seems to be sort of um, ha have almost troughed and, you know, looks like maybe moving higher again. And right. then we've got, a, we've got fiscal deficits in the six, seven, eight percent range as far as the eye can see. Correct. And Correct. I, so Correct. I, what I don't understand is why everyone thinks that the economy is going to be so, so weak as to prompt any cuts at all to me the the risk is on the right tail not the left yeah i mean that's look that that's my view i think from an economic perspective i don't see how the fed can justify really any cuts even even what i would call the sort of fine tuning cuts that they are foreseeing right remember they have unemployment rising to 4.1 percent in the SEPs. Um, and, uh, they have, um, growth falling to 1.4% this year. And that's the reason to justify and inflation falling. And that's the reason to justify 75 basis points. But as I think, see things setting up, none of those are happening, right? Yeah. I see unemployment, the, the labor metrics, which are anything are a risk of reaccelerating. And a lot has, of that has to do with this effect that we call hyper-financialization. So this relationship between basically equity markets and the real economy, whereby the equity market in this bizarre top US world that we live in actually leads yep. because the only thing that CEOs care about is their stock price. So, mm -hmm. the, so the ditty that we have is one, it's very simple, you know, equity rise, they fire equities, sorry, equities fall, they fire equities rise, they hire and equities have been rising again. So, you know, all that weakness that you saw in 2022 and stocks in the labor market metrics. So things like 
the challenger layoff numbers, the claims numbers that were all going, looking like recession, recession, recession. Last year, as stocks recovered those things, all that weakness has just reversed. Yeah, in this economy, companies do not lay off staff when the stock price is, you know, at, at these kind of multiples, right? They lay off Correct. when the market is telling them that the economy is weak. They're taking their Correct. cues from the market. If the market's telling them the economy is strong and earnings are going to be strong, they're not going to lay off workers. If they're not laying no. off workers, how are we... Are we slowing demand again with fiscal deficits in the six, seven percent range? Correct, correct. I mean, I, you know, it's I, I love listening to the calls from the the PMI guys, right? And there's a couple of the, there's a couple of call, places you can sort of follow them online. And um, Tim Fiore, who's the current chairman of the ISM Manufacturing Survey, they did their sort of semi-annual uh, outlook, and it was you know reasonably upbeat. But what was interesting, it was done before the pivot. And Tim is very good at calling the economy. I really do put a lot of weight on what the guy said. In fairness to him, you know, back in last summer when everyone was really bearish, he was going, eh, I don't think it's going to, I think this thing is okay, actually. Right? It looks actually okay. Yeah. Um, and he just came out and he went, right. I mean, this wasn't a bad survey even before they pivoted. Now they've just given us the green light to just go for it. And I think we're going to have ISM back at, you know, 52, 53 by March. And what's actually interesting about that, you've got to go back 30 years to find an occasion where the Fed cut when ISM came back up above 50. Yeah. Typically they stop cutting or they hike. Right. So it's going to get, I think, really, really interesting. Um, and the question is, is, having arguably screwed it up again in terms of their economic forecasting, do they have the, are they willing to pursue the cut anyway? Because I think there are, there is some rationale to say that there's something else going on here. There is another driving force behind some of the, the parts. Um, I don't know the answer if they do it, but if they do, then there's, you know, look, they can do what the hell they like. But as I always say, you know, there's, I don't judge people. I just like to figure out what the consequences are of their action, right? So, you know, I could see them still in an environment where growth is still relatively robust, still trying to justify, you know, 50, right? But if they do, and, I, and my models are right, and the equity market holds up, which is another thing we need to discuss. Um, then I think it doesn't work well for the long end of the bond market in an environment where I fundamentally believe we're in a structural bear market in fixed income. Um, and if it hadn't been for COVID, that started in 2016. Yeah. So if the, if the trajectory of rates ends up being less dovish, so let's, first of all, let's explore. I mean, we've, we've explored some of the reasons why that might be the case already. I mean, I, I think there's a very strong case for why growth and inflation are both going to be run considerably hotter than yeah. consensus. Here. And you look, fiscal, fiscal is, is a huge part of this, right? I mean, it's just huge. Yeah. I mean, you, go, you want to go back to that late 60s analogy when we were fighting the Vietnam War, which was a big driver of that. I mean, we're arguably fighting three wars now. Right, yeah. if not four, yeah. Right, we've got two kinetic wars, Russia and and uh, Ukraine and uh, the Middle East. We've got a climate change war, and we're in a cold war with China. I mean, it's hugely bloody expensive. All of those things, hugely expensive. Yeah. So I can't, I, I struggle to see how fiscal well the other doesn't, doesn't continue to expand, let alone gets gets addressed. Right. Well, that and, and that reduced. actually might be a bit of a clue, right? I mean. It could be that the Fed is sort of seeing the writing on the wall that deficits are going to continue at this pace, even in the event of a Trump presidency, that he may, he may ratchet back on direct investment, but preserve the tax cuts, right? So, you know, whether you got supply side or demand side, the, the fiscal situation is unlikely to change dramatically. 
Um, the other thing that I think has been a, a really interesting surprise this cycle is how the interest sensitives haven't responded at all. We've gone from right. basically zero rates to 5%. And home builders are, you know, right. are, are Gangbusters. on fire. Right? Like right. Right. Um, auto manufacturing on fire. Like which area of the economy is going to respond to higher rates that would prompt the kind of cuts that the Fed is suggesting? Well, I, I think in fairness to the Fed, they're not, right? I'll, I'll, read, you a, I'll read you a quote that, um, from Chris Waller, which I thought was quite interesting from last week. So he said, in many previous cycles, which began after shocks to the economy, either threatened or caused, causing a recession, the FOMC cut rates reactively and did so quickly and often by large amounts. This cycle, however, with economic activity and labor markets in good shape and inflation coming down gradually to 2%, I see no reason to move quickly, as quickly or cut as rapidly in the past. So I think this goes back to a large extent what they are trying to do, this opportunistic policy, disinflationary policy framework, which is what Greenspan did. But they've done an absolute appalling job at explaining this to the markets for whatever reason. So we. You know, they, they keep saying things, well, you know, the market can do what the market wants and we'll see which one's right. We're right or they're right, you know. And I, I just think it's so self-defeating. And so I don't understand why they don't have, and we discussed this on a policy call this morning internally, where they don't have the balls, basically, to come out and say the sort of things that you see from other central bankers, where the other central bankers just go, no. It's too early, yeah. right? I mean, one thing I think that's been quite interesting and something that's got me thinking a lot is, you know, comments from the Bank of England who have highlighted the fact that, sure, goods inflation is zero or negative, right? But goods inflation is always zero or negative. And what's right. more important is service yeah. inflation. Right. And, you know, the Bank of England said, you can just forget it because service inflation is still miles above from where, where it should be. Yeah. And, you know, when we look at it, I know everyone gets their knickers in a twist about, oh, owner's equivalent rent, and it's going to come down. Sure, it's probably going to come down. But actual fact, when you look at the dynamics versus the overall service thing, it could still come down, and overall service inflation could remain relatively high. I'm not saying, it's, you know, it's not going to come down a bit, could it, but it could remain uncomfortably high yeah and we haven't even really seen any kind of self-reinforcing labor cost spiral right i mean they've no. been miraculous how labor has been completely neutered in this cycle they had they haven't had any negotiating power at all they're you know no, i mean you still but you have you have got atlanta wages which i like you know still running above five and that's still pretty bloody brisk right Sure. I mean, we just still also far gained. Yeah, no, 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 no. But I think they, they, yes, exactly. They're still far behind, but I think they're going to, I see no reason why they don't catch up. Right. But Which I, would I, be I another can't see politically. Impulse, right? Mm. right. I just can't see politically how wages don't, over time, and this is the big political problem that Biden faces, right? He's, the economy's in great shape, right? He's just getting the blame for that 20% haircut that you took in the real disposable income, essentially, yeah. as the US corporate sector ripped your bloody heart out in terms of price increases, because we live in this highly uncompetitive economy. Yep. And so what has to happen now is over time, wages need to play catch up to rebuild that 20%, or you're gonna a shitload of political turmoil um, in this country, which I think you're gonna have anyway, but, you know, I, I don't see wage, why, I don't, none of our models are suggesting wage, wage pressure really drops all that much. It still looks to me like it's stuck at five and change well into 2024. Right. Which, I, that's why I, I struggle to find any rationale for the Fed to really cut at all and certainly to go beyond 
you know, a couple of 25s, which are either justified because, you know, they've cocked it up and they don't want to ride it back and say, oh, no, we were wrong again. Or, and I do believe this is the case, and I hear this from policy friends, out of fear of Trump, right? There is a large institutional fear in the Fed, and you can see it in all the global elite. I mean, just look at what Matt, you know, Christine Lagarde said about Trump. I mean, she broke every single protocol to come out and criticize Trump. A central bank governor should not, not under any circumstances, certainly a foreign one, say anything about a US president. And yet she did. And I think that to me is just indicative of the angst in those policy circles and of that global elite. So, so how do you think they go point... 25, 50 on the back of that to ensure there is no slowdown and that we run this economy hot into the election? Because Janet Yellen, sure as hell, her behavior is she's yes. doing everything to frustrate the Fed's attempt to slow this economy down by the equity market. You know, I don't know. But as I said, you can do what you like, but it just has consequences. In that environment, I don't want to be long the bond market. Yeah. How does the Trump presidency change things, if at all? So it's something that, uh, you know, I, I've been reaching out and, and starting to examine with policy friends. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very worried in this world. Not, you know, it doesn't impact markets immediately, but it will, it will impact us on an ongoing basis. I'm, I'm very worried about it, what it does to the geopolitical side. Look, I think he... To your point, I mean, he rolls over his tax cuts. He won't increase taxes. Um, so you don't address the fiscal problems. I mean, they could even get worse. Yep. Um, I do think there is a risk that he entrenches U.S. isolationism, um, which is exactly what we saw in the 1930s. And you can already see with this acceleration in global conflict that we've got, that we're going back to a world that looks more like the 1970s, right? When I grew up as a kid, you know, there were wars all over the shop. You know, there was conflict and, and coups and every other week in Latin America. There was proxy wars being fought in, you know, Latin America between Cuba, who was a proxy for Russia and, you know, f funding, you know, various rebel groups in Latin America and the US on the other side, mm -hmm. right? You had the same going on in Africa, right? And, and I look at this thing and it looks like that. And one of the reasons it ends up looking like that is because no one's afraid of the bloody global policeman anymore because he has proved to be either incompetent or unwilling to take the steps to actually enforce law, right? And, you know, partly that's because we live in a, in a much more, you know, connected world and it's no longer possible to do what the English did and roll up the battleship into the port and blast, you know, the capital to bits, right? Or to shoot rioters, you know, in the streets, right? You know, that, that's a problem um, when it comes to imposing that. And we've just seen, you know, the difficulties of that the British and the Americans have found taking on these Hutu, Hutu rebels, right? You know, your modern weaponry at two million bucks a, a missile against some bloody drone and a bunch of camels, right? And guys with AK-47s. I mean, yeah, I, these are some of the longer-term inflation trends which really, really do worry me. And it's one of, the, one of the reasons, not the main reason, but one of the reasons why, you know, I am a structural bond bear. And I just don't... I, I think it's very, very difficult to address these problems in the West. Have we seen the trough in rates for this year, do you think? I, you know... Um, I think at least for the next three to six months, I think, yes, we're sure, you know, we got shorted around 392 in 10 year treasuries, a kind of target probably 425 first off and then sort of 440, 450. Um, and it's, you know, it's part of this sort of reset, um, and this tightening, this offsetting, moving, tightening financial conditions that if the equity market will not give up the ghost, right? And as I said, I don't think Janet 
Yellen has, and she understands this type of financialization, this relationship between stocks and employment, right? She's not willing to let this thing go. And she's got some pretty big tools that she can deploy, right? She's done a great job at basically pushing refunding into the front end of the curve and then draining, draining liquidity from the reverse repo. What an unbelievable hit to taxpayers this is to continue to front load funding. Like, honestly. <laughs> yeah, but come on, we've got to win the election. Right? <laughs> we've got to fight. You know, the, the fear of the orange man is much greater than, than the fiscal, you know, survivability of the U.S. long term. I mean, it's just, I mean, this is all just fiddling while Rome burns type shit, right? It's, that's where it comes scary when you look at this and go, really? Is that what our politicians have really come down to? And I think the answer is, I hate to say, I think yes. Sorry to interrupt, but I did want to take a quick second to remind listeners that while we do absolutely love providing our audience with world-class guests and weekly investment insights, we wanted to remind you that we actually do our best work outside of this podcast. And we try to do this by providing cutting edge, globally diversified and systematic investment strategies that are designed to be broadly non-correlated to traditional equity and bond portfolios. So we actually manage private and public funds, as well as bespoke separately managed accounts for investors that seek the potential to smooth out portfolio returns in the long run. So if you do want to see that theory that we've been talking about put into practice, please do go ahead and check us out at investresolve.com. Now back to the podcast. So why isn't gold running in this environment? Well, I think part of the problem uh, for gold, I think gold has performed quite well, right? If you look at it against the S&P, it's actually held its O uh, for qu quite, quite a long time. But I think, you know, the big disappointments is when you look further down the kind of periodic table really, and, you, and, and, and sort of peer periodic table, and you look at things like silver, right, which doesn't look good. Uh, um, and it really shouldn't, you know, you, you break much lower than this and it could start to get look quite ugly. And I think the big problem there is that we built in, you know, lots of rate cuts into the dollar, right? And the dollar is now starting to look a little better as we price out some of these rate cuts, right? Such an aggressive stance on rates. And I do think, you know, when you look at the data, even though I don't think the ECB will cut anywhere close to what's also priced into their curve, I do think there's much more justification for, and in the UK, for some rate cut versus arguably, I don't think, any rate cut in the US, as I said, depending on exactly how the Fed plays it, we will see and that will determine exactly how strong this dollar gets. But it looks, I think that's the immediate, the immediate thing that's weighing, that and the higher rates is weighing on gold at the moment. And internationally, so you were just talking about Europe and the UK, um, how is the European economy looking? How's the UK economy looking? I mean, is it, is it, um, gaining strength in the same way as the No, US I mean, I think the, the UK, UK looks quite vulnerable. I mean, it's really, you know, Brexit was an enormous, uh, own goal. Uh, it's been, it's a structural headwind for the UK and it's something that we talked about for the next decade, basically. Um, the consumer is very vulnerable given the mortgage structure yep. and the, the lack of fixed rate mortgages is going to become increasingly vulnerable to these higher rates. She's got a structural problem to some degree, uh, because, um, we lost a lot of skilled craftsmen post Brexit, you know, they went back to Eastern Europe, um, and they were keeping a lid on, on some of these, these costs. Some of it's being offset by short-term visa issues, but you know, we have a, there just aren't enough workers there. I mean, the same problem as the U S the same problem as Australia. You know, I was talking to a very large Australian bank, their, their treasury team the other day and talking about, you know, how do we grow again with 3.7%, you know, unemployment in the U S and they said, you know, it's exactly the same in Australia, right? They just, there aren't enough workers, right? And so this idea that everything just picks up again, unless you get that productivity burst is going to be, is going to be problem problematic. So I think for the UK, that gives us sort of a stagflationary-esque kind of overtone. Continental Europe is a little more interesting, actually. I think when I look at my models, they've done a much better job at dropping inflation. And I think the primary reason for that, 
and it's something that we that I talked about or hinged, touched on a, a few minutes ago, and that was continental Europe is a much more competitive economy. So the ability of corporates in Europe to price gouge to the same degree that U.S. corporates have done is just not there. There are many practices which in the United States are deemed legal, which are really price collusion that in Europe would end you up in jail, right? You know, I don't know when last time you did your kitchen up, right? But I'm sure when you did, your wife said, right, there's three appliance makers we're going to buy, darling. You know, one of them is going to be Wolf, one of them is going to, and Sub-Zero, the other one is going to be uh, Melee. And you go to the, the dealer and you go, well, I want the dishwasher and the oven and the cooktop and the extraction fan and the blah, blah, blah. And the guy goes, yeah, 20,000 bucks, probably 30 now. And you say, yeah, but I'm buying all, all of them from the same manufacturer. So what's the deal? And which one's going to be better? Can I get a bit of, better deal on the Wolf or the Sub-Zero or the, whatever? And he goes, no, they're 50 bucks difference and I can't negotiate because if I do, I'd lose my license. Right? I mean, that price pollution. Right. I mean, that's price fixing, right? In Europe, you go to jail for that shit and you can go and buy your melee online, basically, and haggle between about five different providers. So it's, it, when, I, when I look at inflation in Europe, it really looks to me like they, they vanquished it. Now, don't get me wrong. They've also got some labor problems. Wages have been sticky um, and high by European standards, 4.5%, so not as high as the, as the US, but pretty high. But it does look to me that those have started to show signs of peaking. Um, when you look at growth levels relative to inflation, uh, sorry, relative to rates, relative to rates, growth levels relative to rates, you could argue the case that if you rank those three economies, that the ECB has the tightest policy to the tune of about, by our calculations, about 100 basis points. So they, they could ease to, you know, 100 basis points. The Bank of England is easy by about 100 basis points. And the Fed is easy by 200 basis points. So the economy that is growing the most has the easiest policy. Right. So, um, so I think they can tweak a little bit. The encouraging signs that I see in Europe, and I think this could become a surprise, not immediately, and there are still steps that I need to be completed. You know, Europe is a very heavily focused, particularly the Germany, which tends to drive a lot of our sentiment around Europe, mm -hmm. to obviously the manufacturing cycle. And the manufacturing cycle is itself very sensitive to the inventory cycle and the capex cycle and there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that uh, as we've seen in the us with you know the weakness that we've seen in europe manufacturing that could be coming to an end um that they got themselves caught up with this bloody great big inventory overhang and so we we'd written you know 18 months ago we'd sort of said you know this manufacturing sector is going to go from um, inventory shortage to from from famine to feet to hangover, right? So we're dealing with the hangover now, right? In the US, I think that hangover looks like it's partly addressed. Europe, it's still, Germany, it's certainly got more to do. But when we look at one of our favorite kind of canaries in the coal mines, Sweden, it looks like she has totally got on top of her inventory hope okay? and now her inventories are running under her orders and so that suggests to me that as we move into beginning of q2 even in europe you could start to see the manufacturing cycle start to pick up again and so how dependent you know, is that on chinese growth i mean europe is my some degree yeah. Some degree. Um, but remember, uh, and, and yes, that will be important. And I think China does look, is a wild card and does look kind of messy. Um, but you're actually, what China I think is going to try and do, um, and you can see already, is she's going to try and export her way out. So, you know, of, of the, part of the problems that she's facing. And certainly when you look at the Chinese equity market, and I've tweeted this, 
it's like a bloody train wreck. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, you know, we just broke a train, a multi-month, a multi-year trend line on a monthly basis that goes back to like 2005 in the Shanghai composite. And it looks like that thing could drop another 30%, 25 to 30%. So yeah, it's, it's a risk, but it's, you know, as I said, I think growth certainly from just from an inventory restocking perspective could push us cyclically in some of these manufacturing PMIs back into expansion territory in Q2. And that I think is going to come as a bit of a problem for some of these central banks. Are you surprised at how resilient countries like Australia, Canada, and the UK have been in the face of these high rates, given the high level of mortgage debt on household balance sheets and the fact that those mortgages reset on average every two or three years? Yes, I am. I am. I mean, I think it's, and as I said, I think in the UK, it's going to start to bite. And I think, you know, in some of these other countries, it's going to start to bite. The US is, is in that sense, a, a little bit of a special, special case. But even when you look at some of these markets, you know, I think we have to remember there's, there's a lot of accumulated wealth, you know, even in, they're less equity focused than some of these other markets, but people have got a lot of money, right? There's a lot of money that you can use to cushion some of this blow. And I think so much of it is, is, in, is in houses though, right? Like there's a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of, yes. For the vast majority of people. Yeah. Right. It's in housing, right? Yeah. That, that's your biggest asset. Um, but there's shortages of houses, right? They're everywhere, right? Everywhere there's shortages of houses. Um, you know, you can see every single government looking at, you know, and they just did it in, uh, I think it was in Canada where they just imposed this thing on, um, on all the, uh, the guys doing, um, short-term rentals, right? They were like, oh, you know, we're going to tax you higher. Every single country is trying to, to loosen up its, its housing market because there just aren't enough homes. Um, so I think that the resilience of the house price thing, and it goes back to your home builders comments, right? Mm -hmm. No one's moving in the U S existing home sales have dried up. So by default, the home builders have to do well in a very, very unusual move. I mean, one that, to be honest, we got, we got wrong. Um, didn't cost as much because you run, that's what stops are for. Um, and they did move in our favor, at least initially. So, but you know, there's a lot of things that are resilient. And if you, if you look at some of the economic papers that people are writing, some of these effects start to kind of wane, right? It's quite possible. A lot of two thirds of the rate increases that we've seen have essentially already worked their way through the economy. And I think, and I think the other thing that people need to bear in mind, and this is, it's going to sound on PC, but I don't mean it like this. The vast majority of consumers don't count. The vast right. majority of consumers spend every red cent that they have yeah. from, from their income. And it doesn't matter whether they spend it on all on food or on all on medical costs, right? It does if, you, if you're trying to pick which ones are the winning sectors within the equity market, right? Is it the food companies or is it the insurance companies, the health insurance companies, right? Yeah. But it doesn't matter from a GDP perspective. Yeah, no, what but it's more from a marginal spending by the middle class who in Australia, UK, and Canada have been bolstered so substantially by paper housing wealth, right? And, right. you know, if your house appreciates at a multiple of the rate of your, sa of your labor income savings every year, then, you know, you just, you feel like you have a lot more money to spend. You feel like you, you have, believe right? that that trend is going to continue and any sign of that cracking, you know, and sure. Also, I mean, this you... has to come out from a mathematical standpoint. Sure, people need to buy homes and form families, and there's a shortage of homes as so a home prices stay stay higher. That means that a much larger portion of people's income is going to mortgage payments that's not going to other purchases of goods and services, right? right? So, so that, that yes, release so that... Valve has to come from somewhere. Yes. So that, that has a, an impact, as I said, on, you know, when you look at consumer discretionary stocks, right? You would expect they're not going to buy, oh, Christ, what's that bloody lap brand they all buy up near me? I live in Boston, Allo, right? You know, they all walk around with ALO, you know, it's one of these millennial brands and they all, and you go in there and you're like, 150 bucks for a pair of, you know, sweatpants? Are you bloody insane, right? But these kids all, all seem to wear it and, 
you know, yes, as they get squeezed out because they have to pay their student loans back or their rent goes, you know, up or, or they're trying to buy a house and all that sort of thing. But from abroad, because they've got no, they don't have that many stocks, right? But from abroad, consumption expenditure, from a GDP perspective, it doesn't make any difference, right? What really makes the difference is how the wealthy spend, right? And the wealthy are locked in. They've locked in their mortgage and their stock portfolio keeps going up. Well, yeah, right, I mean, the UK, well, Canada, and Australia, right? I mean, they're, they're locked less in so, so far as they, so. you know, the wealthy have already paid off, you know, such a substantial portion right. of, their, of their mortgage, right? Right. And the same here in the US, right? I mean, a third of homes being bought with cash. Well, and you, right? the US is a, is a totally different case because only a vanishingly small fraction of the mortgage is reset, right? Because everything's at right. like 20, 30 year fixed terms. So yeah, correct. So look, I think I think it all comes down to this, whether we see, it all comes down to me, to this labor market, right? That's what will dictate Goldilocks, right? Is this, and I, and it's also why I think Goldilocks is, is so insanely difficult to achieve. Yeah, right? I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm more talking about Canada, UK, and because I, and I, just said, I, I think wonder if they they're, if they're good currency shorts, you know, I wonder if, like, yes, I think, and I, yeah, you know what I mean? I think they, they, they think ultimately they are. I do think they will be forced to cut. Will they cut? And as I said, look, if you rank them, and I, you know, Australia, I haven't done this, uh, but if I rank the big three currency pairs, uh, it, yen doesn't really come in great because the BOJ on it's still on its different planet kind of yeah. thing. But if I would look at relative growth relative to rates, right, and say who's running the tightest, where, and given that growth is picking up, Who's, where the biggest su surprise is going to be. The biggest surprise would be in the US, where, where rates should not get cut, and if anything, do need to go up arguably more, so that's dollar supportive. Then the better, next one is sterling, and then the worst one should be Europe. And I think there's a case to be saying that you could end up with quite a weak euro. I don't think it's as weak as, you know, necessarily some people think. Um, because I do think growth is will pick up a little bit, but the ECB can easily justify cutting rates. And then you you know you put a Canada and Australia in there, you know they're 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 in somewhat similar circumstances I think to the UK. Sorry to interrupt, but I did want to take a quick second to remind our listeners that the team works really hard on these podcasts. We spent a lot of hours trying to get the right guests, and we do a lot of prep work to make sure that we're asking the right questions. So if you do have a second, just do hit that subscribe button, hit that like button and share with friends if you find what we're doing useful. Thanks again. Now back to the podcast. Yeah. Um, okay. Equities. Leave the best to last. Ooh. So, I mean, what are, you, what are you seeing on the equity front here? I mean, look, if you, if, if you broadly look at the S&P, it's gone nowhere for two years, right? Last year, it was down until the fourth quarter. Then Janet Yellen rather deftly slewed all the issuance to the front end of the curve, drew liquidity back into the system as a result, out of the reverse repo into um, the liquidity metrics, which set the, the level of the equity market. And, and we got this everything rally, right? We got an everything rally. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an important thing that people need to bear in mind. If we are in a structurally inflationary, higher inflationary environment, which I believe is the case, um, you are back into an environment that basically existed prior to 1998. 1998 was a year in which Alan Greenspan, for the first time, shifted from focusing on inflation to focusing on deflation. Because even in 1998, he was beginning to talk about the risk of the zero bound. So this point in which you know, the, the central banks would lose out of ammo. And so they became much more focused on preventing deflation. And that did something really very dramatic and unprecedented. It slewed the correlation between bond and equity prices. So prior to 1998, and there's a Bank of England study that goes back and looks at 250 years of bond and pricing, bond and equity pricing. So prior to that period, you'd never, ever, ever seen negative correlation between bond and equity prices. So both assets either went up or down together. So bonds rallied, 
yields fell and stocks rallied or vice versa. And from 1998 onwards, that relationship changed as you move to focus on deflation. I think we're moving back into that positive correlation environment. And it's certainly been the case since 2020. There are bouts where we've gone back into negative correlation. But Q4 was all about a positive correlation rally, right? It, everything rally. Now, that got people quite excited by this idea of the reflationary cycle. So we had people thinking about, do I buy the Russell? Do I buy the blah, blah, blah? Do I buy the blah, blah, blah? You know, do I buy cheap things? Are we going to rotate into stuff? But the reality of the situation is, um, I struggle with that thesis. I think it could pick up a little bit in Q2 if, if we start to see these PMIs come back. But, it, you know, but then, you know, from, from you look at the growth value metric, which is we've gone back to, right? So growth picked up in Q4 and into the beginning of, Q, in, of this year for the first week at least. Uh, so value did, value outperformed, and then growth kind of underperformed. Now growth is coming back and providing all of that, you know, the big mega caps are providing all of that. that mm -hmm. thing. Now, we were talking before this about some of those names, like Tesla, I think is a, is a classic bubble. I mean, I, you know, I, I just tweeted out, and I know, well, I will tweet out, I'm just, uh, I know I'm going to get shit from the, from the apostles of, of Tesla, which is, I think, a fundamental problem. They're not investors, they are believers. Um, but to me, Tesla is a, a narrative that's been fit to a price action and a price action that was created by QE. Uh, and you can see the dooms when, when Tesla started to perform. And it was exactly when the Fed did in 2019, not QE, if we remember that. And then yeah. we had the COVID QE. And it peaked exactly at peak Fed liquidity. Right? And since then, it has not managed to recoup its thing. And people are like, oh, but, you know, it'll come back, it'll come back and it'll build a bloody robot and it'll the cyber truck and all this bullshit. And the reality of the situation is this is just a hyper bubble. But there are some obviously good companies still left. You're paying an awful lot for them. Um, and the reality of the situation is, is when I look at the U.S. equity market, I think this is a massively, massively, massively overvalued market versus the rest of the world. Right? Like four standard deviations mm -hmm. overvalued versus the rest of the world. But those dynamics are unlikely to change until either the dollar declines and that hurts foreign investors who've got their money in the US and or the bubble bursts because it just runs out of puff, let's say, which doesn't look like that's the case. Or we go into recession and that doesn't look like the case either. And so for me, you've got this sort of ongoing, self-reinforcing, truly reflexive type cycle going on in the US equity market, where the purchase of the asset, in this case, stocks, underpins, wealth underpins, employment underpins, Fed rate hike underpins, the dollar underpins the valuation of US stocks for foreigners. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very self-reinforcing, literally reflexive in the suit true Soros-esque sense of the world mm -hmm. uh, cycle. And I struggle to see that ending. And I particularly struggle to see that ending because I said, I think Janet Yellen, since the, you know, really since you three of last year, has understood that she can't, she's only got any one job, right? And it's radically different from the job that she used to do. Her job these days is to just get her boss reelected. And if, as I think she understands this, stocks determine what goes on in terms of employment, then you have to keep this equity market buoyed up. And she has, between her ability to slew issuance and control the reverse repo and this other big pot of cash that she hasn't kept, the Treasury General account, if she sees stocks wobble at all, she can just pump liquidity into the system. Mm -hmm. And that's just another reason. Uh, so I kind of struggle with seeing a big bearish, bearish move. I mean, could you get a 10%er? Sure, you could get one of those any day of the week, right? But a big bear market between now and the election, 
you know, I, it, it doesn't look, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't yeah. feel that way. Um, and that's why another reason to be bearish bonds, right? Because if stocks aren't going to do any of the heavy lifting to try and tighten financial conditions, it has to be bonds. Maybe, yeah. the dollar, maybe the dollar plays a bit of a role going forward, you know, in the next couple of months. You know, that would help a bit. But um, it's going to have to be, uh, it's going to have to be bonds a lot. So is there a sleeper trade besides being, you know, um, net short fixed income? Uh, you know, are you, are you interested in, are you looking at Japan here? Jap Japanese equities? No, look, I like, I do love Japan. I do love Japan, uh, uh, but there's a couple of concerns I have about Japan. So the first one is, is the politics is a bloody mess, right? And so I think, I mean, a real mess, a real, real mess. We write about this a lot uh, with clients. We're one of the few shops, I think, that have anyone who really has experience in Japan and follows Japan. And Jeff is, is being very good on this one. Um, and um, the politics are a real mess. It could end up over the next couple of years, really destroying sort of the, the, the LDP's iron grip over Japanese uh, politics. So that could get really quite interesting. But the, but the impact of that for markets is it probably delays the, uh, the BOJ's normal, uh, normalization of or the end of negative interest rates. Um, we don't think they can really probably move until July. So some of the euphoria that you kind of see around some of the banks, which have been great trades, brilliant, brilliant trades. Um, and really one of the driving forces behind the Nikkei, that kind of may uh, retest that, but I would buy on any dip. Um, the other thing that um, I'm a little uh, concerned about in Japan is if you go back and you look at history and you go and look at back like 2007 and the dot-com bubble, you get this interesting factor before the whole global equity market goes, Right. And that is, it seems that equity investors go, yeah, the US is a bit expensive. Bloody hell, have you seen how cheap Japan is? I'll have me some of this. And you get this major, like, final, like, woo, Japan is the final, like, hurrah, where you pile into this thing. Now, that said, I have a, I have a little chart that I'm watching. We're not there yet. I'm looking at the Japanese banks. Uh, in dollar terms, I think it's the best piece of chart porn that I've, I've got. And you can draw a multi-year line that comes in at $2 for the Japanese banking index. And if we can crack above that and we haven't, then I think it can double or triple from there. But until it does, I'm not would you be Would you be a buyer of Japanese equities hedged or unhedged? Uh, I would be inclined to do them unhedged when I buy it. I want to buy it unhedged. And that's, that's another reason why, you know, look, we're still in this game where, you know, oh, you buy Japanese equities because the yen is, is weaker and they really just a yen play at the moment. And that is in itself is just a treasury trade. And, you know, it's all, when you start running the correlations across the book, you find out that by short, being short treasuries, you've got a lot of the same trades on. Um, and as I said, I think Japan is an interesting story. Is it there yet to have autonomous growth? Eh, I don't know. And, and as I said, the problem is, is that as long as the U.S. is growing so rapidly, and that means running a very large current account deficit, we need all the world's cash to fund it. And so until those dynamics change, it's kind of tough yeah. to buy other things. I'd love to. I'd love to, but you need either the dollar to break down and that makes, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Watanabe go, what, what, you know, why am I not making money on my U S stocks? Oh, cause the yen's going up. Okay. Or you need to go into recession in the U S that current account deficit shrink and the money go home. Um, or we just need to burst the bubble in U S stocks. And one day, you know, we just find out Nvidia can't grow at 25% per annum, right? Or hundred percent per annum or whatever the hell, you know? The equity analysts have penciled in for this week, right? Yeah. Uh, is there any trade, no matter how niche, that we didn't touch on that, that is worth mentioning? You know, no, we don't really get involved in very niche stuff. We're, we're pretty plain vanilla macro. Um, and, we, you know, we're looking at some stuff 
you know, the, the, the oil markets this morning, we were discussing, you know, crude kind of looks quite interesting, um, potentially for a move to the top side, which would get a little interesting, but not, there's nothing much really, really compelling outside, you know, all our, all our CTO models, you know, are long now, pretty much every stock market with the exception of, um, FTSE. And, um, we're short, you know, most bond markets and, you know, the dollar looks quite interesting, um, you know, for further strength. I mean, one of the ones that's had a big run, you know, is dollar mix. We come down to like multi, multi year trend lines, uh, on, on, uh, the dollar against the Mexican peso and down here, if anything, you're probably supposed to be a bit, a little bit long. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's. It's not like, you know, it was easy in 21. You just shorted bonds because inflation was going way up. You know, last year was a choppy macro year. I think this will show us its hand, um, but it doesn't look like this is a market where you're supposed to be betting big yet on macro outside probably fixed income. Right. Awesome. Julian, before we go, where can people find you? So, um, you can find us if you, if you're interested in the institutional product, reach out uh, to support at mi2partners.com. And if you want to, the, and it, also if you want to follow what Raoul and I both do on Real Vision, because we obviously produce a, a joint product there, you can use the same email address. And if you just want to follow me uh, on Twitter uh, at JulianMI2. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Always a powerhouse of guests and an awesome conversation. So um, until next time. Thanks so much indeed.